what's up YouTube um, starting another Q&A session uh, whether or not anyone uh, oh, there, now we got some people in here how's it going everybody thanks for joining we're starting a new Q&A uh, I put out and asked for a couple of questions today we got uh, just a few but feel free to drop question into the Instagram live stream if you're interested uh, gl glad to have you here and um, just a couple of questions uh, that came in via the Instagram. I usually post it in my stories, so if you want to um, be able to drop in a question for these live streams, feel free to uh, follow the story and drop in a question when we ask. So um, we got four questions to go through tonight, and uh, happy Saturday, happy Saturday night. Um, just uh, glad to have a little bit of extra time tonight to be able to jump on and do a little Q&A. I'm going to try to do this every week or a couple weeks at least uh, into the new year. I'm just getting a, st a start, a jump on my new uh, resolutions for 2020. So uh, thank you all for being here. If you're here live on the stream, I'm going to jump in here with some questions. We've got one from uh, Mick Pepper. He says, what's your favorite ballad? And this is a very hard question. So ballad, jazz ballad. Uh, I don't know if he was specific about jazz ballad, but that's where my head goes, jazz ballad. There's a lot of them. If I, if I have to just pick one, I really like uh, Spring Can Really Hang You Up the Most. That's a really nice ballad. Uh, I'm a sucker for Body and Soul. It's a really great melody. The first jazz ballad melody that I ever learned was um, In a Sentimental Mood by Duke Ellington. I love Blood Count, that Billy Strayhorn. I'm not really giving a favorite, though. Uh, and I really love playing um, A Flower is a Lovesome Thing, Billy Strayhorn. Uh, that's why it's on uh, one of my recent records, No Arrival. We played Flower is a Lovesome Thing, and I tend to play that on a lot of gigs. Um, yeah, Billy Strayhorn was just a master of melody, a master of uh, composition. And his ballads are really just uh, some of my favorite. So that's from Nick Pepper, favorite ballad, I guess. Uh, either F Flowers of Love Something or Blood Count or um, what were the other ones I said? Spring Can Really Hang Up the Most. All of those are good favorites of mine. Um, if you're here, what are some of your favorite ballads? You know, I'd love to hear what you guys uh, have for favorite ballads or on YouTube. Leave it in the comments below. See, we want to see what you guys are playing, uh, what tunes, ballads that you like. You know, it's another good one is But Beautiful. There's a great Curtis Fuller version of but beautiful that i really like um anyway i could just keep on listening tunes over and over and over again so let's keep moving let's move on to the next question um any tips for your embouchure while playing this is for carlotta.amb on instagram and uh, okay so carlotta any tips for your embouchure while playing so for me my um general sense of playing is to be as relaxed as possible uh, I think you do have to have firm corners. I think you should not smile when you play. None of that is any good, but um, focusing on making sure that the aperture is the right size to support the register that you're playing in is an important one. But most importantly, not getting too caught up in the mechanics for me uh, is important and thinking more about the sound, thinking more about the airflow and making sure that um, things just feel natural and feel easy. Uh, that's usually what I go for. Um, I'm not a big technical, like, move this here and move this here kind of person. I think everybody's body is different, and everybody's going to respond differently to putting a piece of metal on their face. <laughs> and uh, you should do what feels as natural as possible. It's never going to feel super natural, I don't think, but um, just trust your instincts and uh, trust your... Uh, what feels good to your body and your chops. Any Stan Kenton ballad. There's that great arrangement of uh, Here's That Rainy Day. That's a nice one. Parker, Philip Parker. Uh, Bennett, nice shirt. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Um, so anyway, so just to kind of sum that up, I, I would hope that you would not put too much tension, focus on relaxation, focus on movement of the air focus on trying to keep things uh, nice and relaxed and that'll be probably the best bang for your buck when you're thinking about um, how to how to think about your embouchure while you're playing uh, so another question from justice man dot trombone on instagram uh, he asks what are some good exercises to work on accuracy 
in the upper register. So let's see, accuracy in the upper register. So the first thing I always suggest to people when they're playing in the upper register uh, is to play not exercises because exercises just make you good at playing exercises. So I suggest playing songs. Um, you know, a great one to start with is the opening to Getting Sentimental. That's something I talk about with the freshmen that come to UNT. Uh, we talk about playing the, in, the, first, the first line. There's just that part. If you can do the whole A section, even better. But um, we just talk about playing actual phrases and playing real music in the upper register. Um, and now this particular person is asking, you know, about accuracy. So in terms of accuracy, you want to pick something that has uh, leaps in it. You want to pick something that has some notes you need to pick off, some notes you need to kind of be able to hear in your head and then hit them. Um, some different exercises that I have for use, for accuracy in the upper register would be, you know, just picking off notes, individual notes, kind of put the horn down, pick it up, uh, and then play that note. Uh, and the other things would be to, to put together some arpeggio exercises that go into the upper register, get into those high notes. Uh, don't just stay in the comfortable register. You know, if you're not sounding bad when you practice, uh, you're probably not practicing the right stuff. That's kind of where I sit on that. You should sound bad when you practice. And you should be doing things that push you, doing things that challenge you, doing things that really, you know, stretch your ability and skill set. Um, so practice real music, you know, take an, uh, a Roshu etude or an Arbenz etude, you know, play it in tenor clef, then play it in treble clef, then play it in alto clef, or just play it in bass clef up an octave, or put it in tenor clef up an octave. That'd be really, really high. But um, there's just, there's tons of ways you can uh, make sure that you're pushing yourself uh, to, to practice the upper register in different ways. So if you're joining us here on Instagram, feel free to drop some questions. We've, I've got a few that have come in throughout the day. Uh, in turn for this Q&A session. Uh, if we have any other ones, we can add those in. Otherwise, we'll keep moving on these ones that are collected here. But uh, I'm interested to hear what you all have to say. And um, so thank you to these couple people that submitted via Instagram. That was Mick Pepper, Carlotta, Justice Mann. And then we have one other one that's kind of a big one. Um, might take a while to answer this question. So if there's any other ones, we while I'm answering, uh, feel free to drop them in. So, uh, somebody with a screen name, I don't know this person's name, but the screen name on Instagram is Cross in Bone. Um, he left this question. He says, with regard to the limited amount of trombone gigs out there, an influx of hundreds of trombone performance majors every year graduating music college who are flooding the market how do you prepare your students for the realities of being a freelance musician? Well, the first thing is that I don't know that all of my students, or all students, all people, are aiming to be a freelance musician. I do agree with you. There's lots of people that want to be musicians. Uh, they go to music school, and then they come out year after year after year, and there's he, this person's right, cross and bone is correct. There's more people than there are gigs uh, to, to play. So um, for me, the advice that I give is that if you want to come to a place like New York, for every little sliver of musical genre, I guess is the way to put it, like very specific parts of a genre, niche parts of a genre, like there's people that are amazing at doubling and sight reading. So those people are like really great at Broadway gigs. And then there's people that are really great at pop horn stuff or like playing lots of instruments or being an orchestrator plus leading a band and just like all these different like weird little niches, early jazz, free jazz, all these different things. There's somebody that's an expert at that thing in a big scene. So you go to LA, you go to New York, Wherever you go to, there's people that really specialize in that thing. So you either need to decide that you're going to be a super specialist and you're going to be really known for doing one thing. Or you need to be okay with doing everything and kind of be known as a freelancer, known as someone that can do anything. But be okay with the fact that if you decide to go that route, that then you're going to be kind of a 
uh, a free that you're that person that does everything. You're not that person that is like specifically focused on a certain thing. And for me, you know, during school, I think it's important to learn as many different things as you can and try to master as many styles, learn the history of styles, learn the history of trombone and everything. But then when you're trying to like do your masters, when you're trying to get out into the world, for me, I think you have to decide what it is you want to do, um, musically speaking. Like you do everything, of course. Like I've done everything, uh, playing all Broadway and wedding gigs and jazz gigs and my own records. But you know, where is it that I want to land and where is it where that I want to put the most focus? Uh, and for me, it's like being a soloist, being an improviser. Maybe soloist isn't necessarily the right word, but being an improviser and having that improvisation be the focus, be the center of what I'm interested in doing is important to me. And I think that can be important for you too. Um, if, if for this person that asked the question, cross and bone. Um, but the advice that I give is, you know, think about your favorite players and you have to be able to compete with them for gigs. And if you aren't practicing and pushing yourself to a level where you could theoretically take your teacher's gigs or take, you know, sub for, play a sound check for, play a rehearsal for, you know, your heroes, then you aren't practicing hard enough and you're not going to be able to, you know, get into those things. If you are a person that has that aspiration to go to a big scene, to go and play um, in New York or L.A. or London or wherever, I'm not trying to be just only U.S. centric, but... Um, you have to be able to play and compete on the level of everybody else that you look up to. So putting yourself and holding yourself to a high standard before you get out of school for me is um, really important. And uh, there are hundreds of trombone performance majors every year who graduate from college, as this person said. And so how are you gonna be better than, better than them all? I'm sorry, like I don't mean to turn music into a competition, but you know you do need to have a certain degree of proficiency on the instrument. You have to be able to sight read and the expectation of sight reading, and I've told my students this, is that it's right the first time. And you say, how do I get good at sight reading? Well, you sight read every day until you read it like you read words. You read music you know, like you read words. You know, the first time, not the first time, but as I played more and more Broadway shows, for example, um, the hard thing is not reading the notes. The notes is the easy part. The hard part is the coordination, is the playing with the other people, with knowing what the cues look like. If you can't even read the music the first time, you've got work to do. You know what you need to be working on in order to be that freelancer. You know? And for me, I kind of focused on being a, more of a jazz player than a freelancer that did classical and jazz. You'd have to ask someone like Alex Isles. Alex Isles does that super, super well crossing genres. Andy Martin, I know, does some of that stuff too, like out in LA. But for me, I've always been focused as more of an improviser, focused as more of a person that wants to um, be able to focus on improvisation. So that's the answer to that question. I hope that's uh, decent advice, um, cross and bone. I hope I answered your question. Uh, if you're just joining us on Instagram, we're doing a little bit of q and I got some questions that I had already collected, but if you have a question, uh, feel free to drop it into the comments and uh, we'll try to answer that. Well, we've gone through, I think, all of the questions that uh, I had. Oh, excellent, Cross and Bone, he's here. So he saw, amazing. Um, hopefully that answered your question, man. I, I, it's a tough one. It's a really a tough one. Uh, that's the advice that I give to my students. And, um, you know, the other thing is about just kind of being realistic with yourself about where you want to end up and where you want to be in life. And do you want to be a, in a big scene or do you want to be, you know, a big fish in a small pond, which is totally fine. Uh, but knowing if you go somewhere and you can do all the gigs that are coming through town and that makes you happy, then you should do that. You should, you know, rather than go to a L.A. and have to compete against all those people. But um, it just depends what what you want out of your music and what you want out of life and where you want to be and logistically and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think, you know, of the hundreds of trombone performance majors that do come into the school, out of the schools, you know, I think uh, there are a good amount of them that end up pursuing other things. You know, they are music educators or they're um, just kind of just get into doing other stuff. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. If you are a person that's coming into the market or you're just getting into you know, playing, 
uh, I would I would focus on uh, just being as best you can, being super cool when you go to gigs, and uh, just being a nice person. You know, offer your music, your musicianship, and uh, go from there. Cross and bone. Yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, this is just one person's opinion. I'm still a young person, um, so I, you know, my perspective is definitely skewed in that way. So I, I will uh, definitely admit to my bias towards towards the, towards the younger um, generation. Another question coming in uh, from Nbelt seven one one. What do you know slash have you heard about Oberlin Conservatory? Uh, I mean, I know that Andy Hunter went there, a great jazz trombonist who's now in the uh, WDR big band playing, I think, third trombone. It uh, doesn't matter really which part, but, um, and Andy's amazing. I know that Robin Eubanks used to teach there. I don't know who's teaching there now since Robin left. Um, I know they have that great high school program. Um, I know that I know that's a liberal arts college. I know I've run into a lot of musicians in New York who are from Oberlin, and I think that they do a great job of educating people. And I think I, I believe it's also a liberal arts school, so you can do some other stuff other than music. I think uh, I'm not an expert on all colleges, so you might want to look it up if you're interested in Oberlin. Um, there's a lot of great musicians that have come from Oberlin, so if you think are thinking about that as an option. Uh, for your schooling, future schooling. And I know they have a great summer program, and I know they have a high school, um, I don't know if it's a boarding school, or they have a high school program where people go uh, and I think live there, kind of like conservatory style, focused on studying music. So uh, I think it's a great way to be able to focus on music at a young age. So Oberlin, uh, definitely worth checking out. Thanks for the question. That's nbelt711. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. And uh, another question here. Feel free to drop in a question if you have any. Uh, but this is from Johan. How important is it to be able to play the piano as a trombonist? Well, um, in terms of performance, probably not that important. But in terms of learning harmony and being a single note player, it's extremely important. And you know, I tell my students this all the time. The first time I went to Wycliffe Gordon's house, who's great jazz trombonist, if you know Wycliffe Gordon, um, when I was in college. So I used to drive from Eastman down to New, down to New York to have a um, to have a um, sorry lesson. Uh, we the first thing he would have us have me do was play a couple things. And then he's like, "All right, can you play all the things you are on the piano?" And I couldn't do it, and we spent the rest of the lesson him just showing me a few things about the piano. Um, so. It is important and it, because uh, as a single note player, you don't get the visual, you don't get the uh, understanding of harmony, hearing and playing and feeling the vibrations of the harmony. Uh, the more piano that I've played in my studies, um, I feel like the better my ears are, the better I can hear harmony because you've played it before. I think there's a connection between playing harmony and hearing harmony. And so the more that you can play the piano, at least on a very basic level in terms of jazz, in terms of playing through tunes, roots in the left hand, third and seventh in the right hand, sing the melody and just go through tunes that way, that gets you you know, 80% of the way through hearing and understanding and processing a tune. Uh, obviously, you, there's levels way beyond that that you can go. But as a general starting place, if you're learning songs, trying to get better at playing jazz and playing harmony, that's the first step for me. Roots in the left hand, third and seventh with the right hand, and just kind of go from there. So um, happy practicing uh, with your piano skills. Uh, for But for anyone, anyone that's trying to, to learn learn piano, learn trombone, jazz, harmony, etc., learning piano is super important. So uh, Johan, I hope you jump in and learn some piano. Um, and let's see, have you... Let's see, uh, Christian here says, have you ever soloed in eighth position? Well, he probably meant that as a joke, but I would be lying if I said I never dropped my slide off the stage. Uh, there, there have been times where, I, and I'm sure there's a few people, I don't know if they'll make it to this point in this live stream or this YouTube vi video that this will become eventually, but uh, that can verify 
I will not name any names, but they could verify that I have dropped my slide and soloed in eighth position, as uh, Christian asked. Uh, but anyway, thank you all for being here. If there's any more questions, jump them, uh, drop them in here in the Instagram. We've kind of gone through all of the questions that we had pre-populated. Uh, oh, one more. Come in from insta one ninety nine. Thanks for asking the question. He says, uh, what separates the pro uh, from the amateur? That's a good question. Um, I've had this conversation before, actually. Uh, it's not the first time I've seen this question. I think a professional versus amateur musician is someone who can demand monetary resources for their musicianship. That's a pro um, and does it regularly. It's not just like a once in a while kind of thing. It's a, a professional musician is somebody that lives their life making a living through music. And that, I don't think that means that it has to be exclusively through music, personally. I mean, different people probably have different opinions. But I don't know that you have to be making music all the time to be a professional musician. Um, but I don't really think there's that much of a distinction between the two, really. It doesn't really matter. Um, great musicians are great musicians regardless of if they make an income from playing music or they just play music that is really great but does not have a large following doesn't mean it's not good music in my point of view Charles Ives the great composer very kind of avant-garde was an insurance salesman but his music has is legendary within that sphere you know he did something else to make his money though so um you know I don't know that the definition kind of makes any difference i mean for me the importance between being in that dichotomy i suppose is that if you're an amateur musician working another job you might not have enough time to put into your practice and uh, getting better and improving learning new skills learning new music etc cetera, etc cetera, where a professional musician is dedicated you know kind of solely to being hired to play in different people's bands or their own thing or whatever. But um, I don't know if I've ever introduced myself to anybody and said like, oh, hey, I'm a professional musician. Um, I don't really, I don't, I don't really um, identify that way. I think I identify as uh, uh, I'm an improvising jazz musician and a professor and I run a, a, a content media company, record label, and so I, I don't know that being a professional musician is really as kind of black and white as it used to be maybe, or maybe it never was, I don't know. But, uh, and I think at different points in your career, someone might be more quote unquote professional or more amateur or whatever. But um, it's an interesting question. And uh, one that I hope, I think we need more people that are willing to be open to that you know, fluctuation you know, there's a lot of this was directly related to the last question, the question about all of the jazz majors and trombone majors that come out into the world. Um, those people are people that appreciate music and we need to embrace those people and not isolate them and make them feel bad if like they think, oh, I'm going to go and follow this other passion that's not music. You know, there was a, a bass player that I went to Juilliard with. Who decided to pursue something else and like it doesn't mean that person is not good at music and it doesn't mean that that person is not passionate about music and it doesn't mean anything anything that other people say like oh they have to be 100 percent dedicated it's like we're, we're isolating all those people that really enjoy the music and we have to be in my opinion at least more inclusive and try to take all those hundreds of jazz majors or music majors or trombone majors that go out into the world and try to embrace them and have them enjoy our music uh, for the rest of their lives too. To me, that's what's important. Uh, not that every single music major ends up as a quote-unquote professional musician. There's a lot of industry out there related to music that needs people that are passionate um, and just the world that needs an appreciation for culture. So if all of those people can be advocates for um, music, arts, etc. I'm all for them coming to college and being music majors, etc. 
They don't necessarily have to be professional or amateur. That's just my opinion. So thanks, Juan, for the question. And uh, really, all of you, thank you for being here. Um, I'm glad to be able to go through these questions. And like I said, it's my jump on my 2020 resolution uh, of trying to do this more often. I definitely get DMs with lots of questions uh, throughout the week and months, so it's good to be able to actually answer them in a public forum so people uh, can get the answers because there's a lot of repeat repeat questions about similar things, so happy to, to answer. So if uh, anyone out there in Instagram land is uh, has another burning question, drop it in now or else we're going to maybe wrap this up for the evening. And uh, one of our Outside In Music Next Level artists has a show tonight that I'm going to go and check out here in New York. And then it's the holiday break. So uh, Juan, you are very welcome. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's somewhat helpful. I by no means am the expert on any of this stuff, but this is my, you know, my opinion and experience. Uh, so take, as I always tell my students, you know, take, all, take the advice and then uh, make it your own after that. So anyway, uh, if there's not any more questions, we're gonna wrap this up for now, but stay tuned uh, in the future. Watch, watch on Instagram, you'll find more live streams. So uh, happy holidays, happy new year, and uh, we will see you in 2020. Take care.